Okay, welcome to GUI and Inward Browsers, weekly call. Uh, this is uh, 21st of August, 2019. And we have a short staffed call this week. Uh, there are some agenda items we will go through. Um, so Terry and Dietrich are with me. Um, Dietrich is adding some agenda items. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll go <laughs> with uh, the first one. Should I share my screen? I yeah. Share. Okay. So um, the first uh, item on the agenda is co-hosting. <laughs> I hoped uh, for Henrik uh, to be on this call, but uh, so I we won't like probably discuss in in depth. But I'll give a quick update on. Uh, the discussions we had in the past week since uh, the last call. So um, the idea about uh, co-hosting websites, uh, maybe I make it less dark. <laughs> okay. Um, so the idea is uh, both IPFS Companion and IPFS Desktop could provide a better alternative to pinning of websites. And we named that as co-hosting. So the idea is that when you have a website that you care about, there should be like a toggle to join the group of peers that contribute uh, bandwidth uh, uh, for hosting uh, the content of that website. Um, and the idea is uh, it should be, like initially, we, the idea is to use MFS for that. And do not introduce any custom like configuration and things like that. Uh, I wrote uh, on the idea. Uh, I guess maybe too long, but the short uh, shortest idea is that if we come up with uh, some uh, convention for naming uh, a path on MFS for tracking co-hosted websites and all the historical snapshots of those websites. We actually don't need to introduce any like configuration files and things like that, because if we have, let's say, co-hosting directory, and inside the inside of that directory we have uh, either IPNS uh, uh, hashes or DNS link DNS link names uh, as di directory names, and in each of those uh, directories we would have subdirectories with a timestamp of uh, the time when we uh, fetched the specific snapshot. And I guess that's enough for us to have this like distributed uh, orchestration of co-hosting because when we have this uh, directory structure in MFS, then both IPFS companion or IPFS desktop or maybe just a command line bash script or some tool running in the cron is able to check MFS using like IPFS files ls command uh, and return a list of co-hosted websites and then uh, listing uh, contents of the direct specific directory for a specific domain and sorting them by timestamp we are able to tell when was the last snapshot uh, fetched or when was the last snapshot refreshed and then if we agree that there's like a, we refresh each 12 hours or some other time, um, then every uh, application responsible for uh, refreshing co-hosted website can just go there, sort uh, all the snapshots, check the timestamp of the last snapshot, of the latest snapshot. And if it's over the threshold for refreshing, it will just refresh the website, copy the latest version to MFS. If it's the same, uh, as the old one or uh, as the latest one, it just bumps the timestamp. So it renames the directory and also, and actually that's all needs to happen. So it's just, we just use MFS for that. No text files, no configurations, just this convention. And why it's, why I like it is because it's simple. It does not introduce any new config files and any new formats and then it enables us to experiment with uh, user interfaces for managing co-hosted websites. So 
people are a, would be able to both uh, use like IPFS companion user interface or IPFS desktop, but at the same time, they could just go to file screen in a web UI, go to co-hosted uh, co-hosting directory and just manually remove all the snapshots or just remove a specific uh, domain name. So if uh, someone removes a co-hosting example directory, they both remove old snapshots and they just remove this entire website from being refreshed and tracked by all this <laughs> distributed orchestration. So that's the idea. Uh, and, and the idea is just both IPFS companion and uh, IPFS desktop can like implement this in their own pace. Uh, we can, of course, like we should uh, synchronize and agree on like naming labels of or some like user interfaces. But basically, that's that's the idea. Um, are there any questions uh, on this one? Yeah, this this is really neat because I feel like it does uh, it does meet kind of like the the local and offline local network scenario. So, you know, these common cases where you're, say, running an offline workshop or something like that, one person can download the website and then other people can get it from the other people that have it on the local network, even if you're not connected to the internet. So, like, so this enables at the UI level some very some basic use cases that we've talked about for a long time, but aren't reasonably doable right now, um, or at least the foundation for being able to build on some of this. Uh, it, it seems like something that would be useful to do is to spec this out clearly, especially because the goal is some level of interoperability between implementations and different nodes operating on it. Yeah, that's a good question. Where, where we sh should spec something like that? Because that's, uh, so like the way I think about this is uh, we implement this sort of like in user land first. Uh, it does not like require changes to Go IPFS or JS IPFS. We yeah. basically just use MFS, build stuff on top of MFS, and then if uh, uh, if it's like good enough or we need uh, more control, let's say to have a better control on the refresh rate or things like that, uh, we could think about like specking it out and moving it to IPFS core spec, so that moving it from like user land, something implemented yeah. by IPFS desktop and companion, to something implemented natively, just like MFS is, itself is, uh, by Go IPFS and JS IPFS. I'm not sure like if uh, at this user land level, uh, like where that spec would leave. I, I, even if it lives in, in this issue, or just as an, an experimental directory in, in companion repo or something, right? Like, but I think uh, having, especially because the goal is to have multiple nodes be able to operate and have the shared understanding. Mm -hmm. That's why I feel like it should be probably spec that that labeling and naming structure should be spec'd out somehow. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, or maybe we should create like a, a dedicated repo, like co-hosting experiment in IPFS shipyard, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we could just keep like the spec there in README or like spec directory. Uh, as, uh, that would sure, also yeah. act as a good point for synchronization. Because uh, right now, if like me or uh, Henrik uh, from the IPFS desktop have as a question about this, we, are, we don't have like a, a re like project agnostic place to discuss this. Right, yeah, no, that sounds like a good, uh, good solution. Yeah, so probably uh, after this call or maybe tomorrow, <laughs> uh, I'll figure it out. What um so if let's say I am on a, on the same local I'm on the same subnet, uh, but we're disconnected and we both have IPFS nodes running. So like, what would the commands be for me to identify what sites what you have in your co-hosting store? Uh, yeah. So actually, people are not able to browse each other's MFSs. Sure. However your node uh, announces all the CIDs you have in your repo on the DHT. And also if someone on your local network is asking you for a CID that you have, you just provide it. Um, so it would 
sort of work in an implicit way. So if someone is interested in the same website you have in your store, there's no, and it's in the same like snapshot or like most of the website uh, did not change and you have most of it. So actually there's no communication or no signaling needed apart from what's already built into IPFS that person would ask, hey, I want to uh, browse example.com and uh, start to like resolve it to CID and like start requesting blocks. And you, by the act of having those blocks as a part of the snapshot you have in the MFS, you would just provide it. Um, well, so I, so companion in that case would, would hijack the request for example.com or intercept it, see that it has the blocks or that in its local co-host store at MFS, then it would load those blocks up. So let's say, and, and this is just a single node scenario. I've already co-hosted example.com. I'm now not connected to the internet, but I make that request. The companion intercepts the request, loads it from my local MFS first, and then from the local block store. Is that how the local loading scenario would work? Yes, yeah, so offline website. Yeah, so basically like uh, loading a website from your local IPFS uh, node through HTTP gateway would Same just, way, yeah. it would just work because okay. having this website as a snapshot in your MFS uh, is just a way of keeping that uh, those blocks around uh, to keep them from being garbage collected. Right. Um, and that's like the only reason why, like the only uh, like effective func function, uh, functional reason why we have it in MFS, apart from like managing the list of uh, co-hosted websites. Right. Um, how, how do things get in that list? How do I add something to co-host? Yeah, so that's when, uh, so either user interface like IPFS companion or IPFS desktop uh, comes in. Uh, I imagine like in IPFS companion, it's easier because you have like, you can add any, uh, some u interface elements yeah. into the browser. Like wow, browser. somebody's looking at a web page or whatever, yeah. Yeah, there, there's like an icon uh, on, on the browser uh, toolbar and you can like co-host this website. You don't even need to like load it actually from IPFS. You can just like mark that you want to co-host it and it will be added to your local node. Um, for IPFS desktop, I imagine uh, it would either it would be like responsible for refreshing and like managing, uh, but it uses web UI. So I think on the settings of the web UI, we would have like a like, co-hosting experiment, which detects that you have this co-hosting directory and it, it lets you like add domains or like uh, URLs of websites from there. Uh, but it's like just a new UI we can add on top of uh, this. How would, how would this work in embedded node scenario? So let's say I'm running an embedded node in uh, companion. For companion, it's uh, companion is actually uh, backend agnostic sort of. So both uh, HTTP API exposed by local Go IPFS and embedded JS IPFS running in Brave, let's say, both expose the same programmatic interface. Right. So if you add that UI element, just like co-host this website, it would work the same. The problem would be like the storage, the storage right. or in embedded node. If it runs in a browser extension, then we have like an unlimited storage because there's like a flag browser extension can request. Um, however, if it runs on like a regular website, then it will be limited by the current limits in the browser. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in extension level embedded node use case for this because I feel like that's the, that gets us over the, the install hump for having regular users install separate software besides companion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, we are slowly getting there. There's a PR, uh, it's like work in progress uh, to, to actually like implement and enable garbage collection in J, embedded JS IPFS, like in JS IPFS in general. Because uh, right now that, yeah. we don't have garbage collection. So you add stuff to your node, but you, I, you actually 
there's no mechanism to automatically like purge stuff you did not yeah. pin or did not put in the MFS. Yeah. Uh, and we need like to solve that sooner than later. Yeah. I'd, I'd really like to do something like just be able to bookmark a, a URL and then tag it like Firefox has bookmark tags, just tag it with co IPFS co-host or something like that. And then it just co-hosts whatever I have in my bookmarks that I have. Fire, yeah, yeah. Firefox API for managing bookmarks is much nicer. Like it has yeah. more options than the one we would have in Chromium. So that's sort of uh, also, right. uh, sorry for that tangent, uh, like the uh, um, site tracking discussion, but like, uh, the problem with uh, the way we uh, implement our features is that we sort of need to look at Chromium based browsers as, uh, as the baseline. Yeah. There are um, a lot of features, very nice features we could implement in Firefox, but then we diverge code base and we need to like test and maintain yeah. effectively to different code bases. So, so far we've been pretty good at like, keeping a single code base, but that's, that's always a struggle. Yeah. So if you're picking sites to co-host, are you looking at real human readable names? Yep. That's, uh, that's the plan. So the plan is if we go, let's say to docs, IPFS IO or like, uh, Turkish Wikipedia, right? Uh, those have okay. uh, like regular Wikipedia on IPFS.org or docs.ipfs.io um, name. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the web browser, there would be like an icon or a, a position in the me menu, menu uh, after clicking on IPFS icon to co-host this website. Uh, and that's it. So maybe this is a silly question, but does that mean if I'm the one who makes the website first, I have to go like buy a domain from Namecheap or whatever before then the people co-host my thing with a nice readable name or is there some way to get a free, is, does like IPNS or something let you make a nice readable name that's just in IPFS land that would work for the same thing? Yeah, so right now you need to own a domain to set up the, the, okay. the, the DNS link. Uh, however, okay. Like I hope there will be a service that gives people a subdomain under some like like generic uh, domain which does not require buying a domain. It would just. I think Jim created a very interesting de demo when you use like GitHub for user uh, authorization. Uh, so it does not require any additional accounts. Uh, it just gives you an input when you put. Uh, content identifier of your website and you submit it and you get a domain name. Um, but that's like a separate, separate topic. Uh, how, if, if we, when we implement this, then we can think, how can we make it easier for people to, for, to, for website creators or people who want to create a quick website um, to get a, a, a nice domain. Uh, Hugo, uh, for as a part of his IPNS work, created um, something uh, that was called, I believe, alias or label. The idea was that we would provide a domain name under which people could specify some label when they published IPNS. And when you published IPNS, you, all, you would get a DNS link uh, address for free. Uh, as a as a bonus, uh, so that would not require any like third party service. Uh, it would just work from command line. It would be like limited to uh, like you would still have to take care of uh, pinning, uh, like keeping your content alive. But we would provide a domain name. Uh, so there are mu like multiple ways can, of handling. Can you it. give an example of like what that? domain name would look like in that scenario? Like it was under a pre-configured root domain that we, that we provide, but then people would get a subdomain or something like that? Yeah, yeah, so that would be like, uh, when you publish something to IPNS, you say, let's uh, Dietrich stuff, uh, and you type that as a label, and we would get, give you like Dietrich stuff that, uh, uh, like, websites.ipfs.io or probably different domain. Uh, 
like totally different domain for this purpose uh, for security reasons but it would be like frictionless uh, if you quickly want to share something with a meaningful URL instead of uh, gobbledygook or CIDs. But then in reality, that DNS would never, that DNS request would really never happen, right? Yeah, so, so the way it would At least work, in that scenario, when you're loading it through companion and all that. Yeah, so like the, the, the DNS would have to, the, the DNS TXT lookup, which we use for finding out if this domain name is backed by IPFS. Uh, we do DNS TXT lookup. Uh, so that one DNS lookup needs to happen. Uh, but after that, you don't actually need to send any HTTP requests to any server. You just redirect the local gateway and you load it uh, from IPFS. And uh, okay. yeah, so basically just as a summary for this uh, discussion is that uh, the co-hosting uh, feature would uh, enable people to uh, like pin and follow DNS link websites which have like human readable names. And the topic of how people publish under human readable names is like a separate one. Uh, we can tackle that uh, like separately. But uh, uh, when you say DNS link websites though, so it's not, we can't do it for non-DNS link enabled websites. Oh, we, we can do that for like uh, websites published to IPNS under uh, your peer ID hash. So. Sure, we, sure, yeah. Yeah, so without a human readable name. But I want this feature to work for both because like most of people are interested in like, human readable names. Yep. Still like uh, stuff uh, like let's say Linux repositories or like package manager repositories could be published under IPNS with like peer ID instead of human readable. And some people just would copy that uh, peer ID to co-hosting uh, directory, like create a, dire create a directory with that name and they would automatically become co-hosting uh, entire package manager tree, things like that. Yeah, a lot of really interesting use cases unlocked mm -hmm. by this. This is which is one of the reasons why I I'm really interested in seeing this kind of written up as a as a separate spec so that those different people that are trying to implement it for those use cases can kind of evaluate at a high level what this unlocks for them and give feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, I, I mean uh, from an experimentation standpoint, yeah, just. Ship, ship it now in experimental form. Oh, no, but I totally agree that we should uh, like create that repo and create a spec because uh, apart from IPFS companion and IPFS desktop, what I want to have is just like a bash script. Someone can just add to cron and add it to their server and that, that takes care of like refreshing their websites or website they care. So they would uh, run it in a headless mode as well. So at least we would have like three implementation Three implementations of this uh, co-hosting scheme. Yeah. Yeah. That that the fact that there are three different implementations is where they're going to shake out the issues. I'm very I'm very interested to see how how that concept works across multiple nodes. Yeah, I I really like the, this approach that we are sort of like growing this in user land without like. Uh, taking because if we would uh, design this uh, as a part of like the core, that would be like much longer, uh, much much longer for time between design and like actually sh shipping stuff. Um, we, yeah, but I, I mean, I'm I'm kind of interested. Like, how how much more of, how much more of the core do we want to build out anyway? Right? Like, at what point? How how much how fat do we want the protocol to be? Oh yeah, like I really like this approach. Like. MFS based approach because it does not actually need to be uplifted to core. It could just stay in MFS. It's just a, it's just a convention. Yep. Um, yeah. So that's like an update on this. And it's a it's a really good like kind of dog fooding vector for the protocol as well, right? Like, um, I think one of the things that people don't understand is that things like MFS. Well, not, not that they don't exist, but where they fit into the picture. I think most people's picture is just that narrow content address. You access something by a CID, that's it. Yeah. And therefore, they 
think of that you can't actually build applications on top of the protocol. Yeah, it's but, my, yeah. Well, that, that mutability makes a lot of those benefits. You're trading off benefits at that point too, which is I think one of the things that is extra unclear for developer users who are trying to figure out whether IPFS fits their needs or not. Yeah, I feel this uh, visual of, uh, let me like quickly, just to finish, this visual of having like a di directory with a lot of snapshots. I feel that could unlock some uh, uh, pathways of thinking about like creating apps or like managing data using IPFS. Because that's basically, a lot of people like ask, how do I handle like versioning in IPFS? And you could just create direct snapshots in MFS. Yeah. That's so one. actually, that, that actually should probably be like the, the FQDN there for, for that domain, right? Like, how, like uh, we'll probably need to also make a convention for how the origin is uh, serialized into oh. that path structure. No, There's I, probably I, existing standard around that too. Yeah, yeah, but uh, th yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> That's actually a good, good, good idea. So th the thing is, if you put stuff on, uh, on MFS, right? So there's like this uh, uh, example.com and under that we got like a long list of its snapshots. Then you can just copy CID of the root and share it to someone and you got like the full history of this one website that you accumulated over time. Uh, yeah, so that's that's interesting. Are you not then like storing a gazillion files because you're like every day you're multiplying? Yeah, so if entire website changed, then yes, but usually only a small part of website. Okay, it's more like the get the get concept of like oh yeah that word changed, but we're not oh, storing yeah, yeah. the whole version of the page somewhere. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the, there's like a the duplication at the block level for free uh, when we do this. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think Dietrich froze, or is he just muted? I think he dropped from the call. Um, let's give him. A minute. Um, yeah, let me like need quickly check um, the agenda. All right. All right. So that's uh, more or less on um, co-hosting. Um, the second, uh, the second item. Oh, yeah. Here's the tree. Hey, Dietrich. I think my internet is not great this morning. Yeah, I I quickly moved to the next one. <laughs> Oh, I had so many more questions. No, no, no joking. If you have questions, feel free. I did not move yet. <laughs> keep keeping my video off to keep my uh, internet, my bandwidth usage down. All right. Uh, so, anything else on co-hosting? Any questions? I we'll save it for the next time. Yeah, maybe we'll, next time we'll have hack and uh, repo with some specs and stuff. All right, the next uh, item is, uh, oh, this is uh, like a hard, hard cookie. Uh, so um, HTTP addressing is done using URLs. And uh, in IPFS and the P2P ecosystem, we are using uh, multi others. Uh, the problem is that sometimes we want to represent uh, an URL of HTTP service, let's say like HTTP API we want to use. Uh, we want to represent it using multi-other. And there is a problem 
that conversion from URL to multi other, especially for HTTP URL, uh, is lossy. We, it's not one to one mapping. And there's a discussion we had uh, about uh, HTTP protocol. I wrote some notes from a meeting. Uh, if anyone is interested in this, but uh, the short description of the problem is that we want to support DNS over HTTPS and all the DNS over HTTPS endpoints are on HTTPS website, which includes a domain name and then a path. Uh, so that's a problem because right now the HTTP protocol does not take any argument. And after a long discussion, we realized there's a generic problem uh, around multi-others, uh, how to represent protocol specific parameters. So that means, uh, for example, when we talk about HTTP, HTTPS, which is HTTP over TLS, uh, the TLS itself has something called SNI, SNI uh, header, which tells you, which tells the server which host name it, you want to talk to. And then on the HTTP level, after like inside of encrypted uh, tunnel established by TLS, we can ask for a different host name using host HTTP header. So that's something called domain fraud fronting, which can be used in censorship uh, circumvention. Uh, when you ask, uh, when you connect to remote server and you ask for one domain, and if someone is looking on, at uh, the uh, packets and do, does the deep packet inspection, they look at TLS handshake and they see SNI, uh, SNI uh, field saying, oh, this person wants to talk to this server. And then when uh, the secure uh, tunnel is established, uh, HT, actual HTTP connection uh, starts, uh, HTTP discussion starts, and then a client might ask uh, using HTTP protocol for a different host name, uh, which, uh, Sneaky. right? So that's probably the most exciting uh, use case uh, for this, uh, apart from DNS over HTTPS. So DNS over HTTPS is using uh, the same domain name, However, it's using a custom path, uh, which is the same class of problem. We are not able to provide custom host name or custom path when we specify multi other for HTTP service. So that's more or less the problem space. Uh, short term uh, use would be to be able to specify DNS over HTTPS or any other HTTP based uh, web service using multi others instead of URLs. But uh, like in general, it's not a HTTP specific problem. We may have uh, other protocols that would accept uh, like customization of the connection uh, would have custom properties right now we have no way of specifying like when right now we have just this so right now we have uh let me zoom in so right now we have just yeah i want to connect to this ip using tcp on this port and i want to talk to it using http we don't have uh this part uh, so i can connect to a web service at a specific port but I'm not able to provide custom host name. I'm not able to uh, provide custom path. So I can only use web services which expose the API at the root of the origin. And I'm not able to use things like uh, basic auth or set some cookies or maybe uh, API uh, keys in HTTP uh, headers. So it's like, uh, 
problem, uh, problem, uh, problematic space for us uh, if we want to use multi others more and more, especially in web browser context. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that this, I mean, that ha this problem hasn't been a blocker to stuff that we want to do so far. Yeah, so, so far we've been just uh, using web services uh, which were exposed at the, the, the same host name on the root. Uh, that's how uh, uh, most of things work. Uh, for example, w in JS IPFS, we have uh, an option to customize uh, location of uh, preload nodes, and those are specified using multi others. However, those multi others look like this. There's no path. It's just like domain name and port and the protocol. Right. Um, are you looking, so are you proposing changes to the multi other multi spec? Yeah, so that's an open question. How to represent protocol specific parameters? Right now, it's not possible. And there are, we, during the call we had the last week, I believe, or two weeks ago, we, looked at some ways how to semant like how to extend uh, multi other semantics to enable that and not make it like http specific but uh, make it possible to uh, represent uh, cust custom parameters for any protocol so there are basically two ways we come up with one is to add this like uh, bracket notation uh, in which the parameters are comma separated. And that like this domain, domain fronting I mentioned would look like this. So uh, you connect to a specific IP, let's say something running in, I'm not sure if cloud, serv cloud providers allow domain fronting anymore, but you could run it and like in somewhere else. So you connect to over TLS, you ask for this host name, However, inside of encrypted tunnel, you ask for a different host name, and then you could like add additional token for some web service. Um, I mean, you know we're just gonna end up serializing JSON in there, right? <laughs> so that's the problem, how to make it, how, how to make it uh, s like to feel native to multi other spec, right? Uh, multi it seems a little seems a little tail wagging the dog there. So. Yeah, so that's the problem. How do we represent parameters? One is do something like this, which looks ugly. However, it keeps uh, like the protocol segment intact. It's still just one hop in the path. Uh, another idea was to introduce like a special purpose protocol which is like key value and it, which is applied to the previous protocol, which is messy in my opinion. I like, if I would have to choose something, it would be something like this. So it's just like my PSA that it's an open, open problem. And if someone has any better idea than this, feel free to click on this link and state your idea there. Yeah, well, one question I have is mm -hmm. like, why, why multi-adder? Uh, the idea for multi other is that we can encapsulate uh, arbitrary paths over like multiple hops of multiple protocols. Um, right. Sorry. So I, I guess maybe that wasn't the question that I meant. I mean, like um, uh, for web service specifically, or like for web services, you mean, or do you mean? Yeah. Uh, I guess I mean for, yeah, like, uh, yeah, so uh, it seems like we're bumping up, we're bumping again, up against some design constraints that multi adder yep. put in there years ago. Yep. And that aren't meeting the needs for more sophisticated protocol usage. Yep. So that's so not why multi adder, but maybe like why, maybe we should just change multi adder. Yes. So uh, right now, Turns out it's like a very hard problem. It requires basically like extending the multi other spec. So for now, I believe when we will implement DNS over HTTPS in Go or JS IPFS, we'll probably use URLs. If there will add like a configuration option in your Go IPFS or JS IPFS node uh, where you can like customize uh, the DNS over HTTPS provider. And that would be like regular URL. 
and maybe in the future we will also support multi other in the same field uh, but we don't want to like block uh, implementing dns over https due to this uh, like multi other discussion um, yeah i like that i like that idea of just using urls and in this case it simplifies a lot away a lot of these questions where we're trying to shoehorn a really complicated set a rep string representation of, of protocols relationships and expectations into multi adder which isn't really designed to do any of that yeah and uh, i i agree and i also would like to even if we don't come up with a good uh, like way of representing this i would really like if someone come up with uh, another use case for this apart from H, like web services uh, that want to specify custom host name and path and like mm. headers because right now it's very http centric and i believe we, we we may not be able to solve this in a clean generic way unless we have at least one other use case when we want to provide or overwrite protocol specific parameters it might be worth talking to birdie because bluetooth has a whole bunch of like um, kind of metadata that you can provide around Bluetooth connections in order to specify the nature of the request and all this other stuff. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like a, a good idea. Yeah, so that's uh, more or less uh, what I wanted to mention here. And kind of related, uh, we have two libraries for converting between multi other to URL, to URI, and from URI to multi other and both libraries are now part of multi formats uh, org uh, so those are like official now <laughs> and those are libraries for converting like if you have multi other of this like simple web service and you want like regular url um, it's uh, it also like if you don't specify http at the very end and you have just tcp port it assumes HTTP by default because that's what, like, at least in JS land, uh, people been using this and they had to manually add a slash HTTP here. So we default to HTTP by default, <laughs> and uh, but you can like disable this behavior if you want. And for another direction, there's URI to multi other which is also lossy. So if you have a, if you have a URL to a website, which is using like DNS name and HTTPS, and you want to convert this to multi other, the problem is we don't have actually like a generic DNS protocol. We have DNS four and DNS six. We also have DNS other, but this one requires additional DNS link TXT uh, lookup. So it's like a, a lossy conversion. Uh, by default, we assume DNS4. So when you convert URL to a website to multi other, it, it, it just assumes DNS4. You can overwrite it here. Um, some people are using this uh, as a, like a bridge if they don't want to mix uh, URLs and multi others in configuration of their app. Uh, some people just want to use only URLs for everything or only multi others for everything. So those libraries are mostly used for that. Uh, I believe that's it. Uh, that's the update on this. Um, Dietrich, do you want? Do you have any questions for this? Or no. All right. The, the, the problem seems to be addressed by the previous issue, which is the fact that it's lossy in both directions. Yeah, yeah, it's lossy, and those libraries are the best we yeah. can provide right now to like ease the pain, but you still need to be aware of how what's what's lost when you convert from your URL to yeah. the other. All right, uh, next one, how to cover more of the text matrix? Yeah, so this is, you know, the uh, thanks for adding the companion bits into that matrix. One of the, um, I think we want to probably get to more of that being covered, but it's, uh, it's, uh, like it's pretty uh it's very very empty right now and and that that's a little concerning yeah uh, and i guess you know 
asking, you know, we probably have this conversation when there are people from all the different parts, web UI and desktop and companion. Mm -hmm. But having a plan to fill more of this out with something, even if it's just issues tracked so that people can understand that there's part of the work that we know we want to do, mm -hmm. be a good idea. Yeah, I believe uh, probably to not until next quarter. Yeah, I believe there, there there's like a either discussion on uh, on like a look into having a daily running benchmark for like JS and Go to see if there are any regressions. So uh, nice those tests that we have here. Let's say like when there's a new PR merge to Go IPFS master, uh, we could have like a test suite running once a day to tell if it breaks web UI or companion. Because web UI is yeah. using a small subset of specific APIs and similar uh, IPFS companion is also using a small subset of APIs. However, in the past we had situation when uh, there was like a breaking change or there was like a non-breaking change which turned out to be uh, breaking due to the fact that different browser vendors uh, yeah. <laughs> in, <laughs> run the same JavaScript differently, <laughs> turns out. So uh, yeah, I totally agree that would be very nice to have uh, this safeguard. Right now, the way we do those, at least from the companion perspective, the way we handle this is when Steven announce, announces uh, there is, uh, or, or Alan, uh, that there's Go IPFS or JS IPFS uh, release or release candidate. Like I, I, I usually do manual test, smoke testing against companion, uh, just to ensure uh, the API does not break. Uh, in the past, when we had the very first version of IPFS companion, uh, which was using uh, Zool and all uh, SDK. The good thing about that time was there was a very nice uh, way of orchestrating br like browser running uh, browser extension, and it gave access to like low level access to tell if how the browser behaves. Uh, when we moved to web extensions, uh, nothing like that uh, existed, but it's been some time. So I believe it's worth uh, uh, like looking at the space, at least for IPFS companion to see, are we able to run like actual tests, like tests in live Firefox or live Chromium? Right, yeah. Because right now the test suite we have, just like I, I, I listed here, it's end-to-end -end functional tests. So we, basically it's like a, a subset of unit tests. We don't like test everything, but there are like co hot code paths, uh, paths related to like redirects or paths related to the way we uh, normalize uh, protocol handlers to IPFS paths. So, the, or the way we handle DNS link lookups or, or caching, um, those things uh, are covered with tests and those tests uh, run, we have like CI, however, uh, those run again, like those just run in Karma and in Node and not in actual browser extension, in yeah. actual web browser. So that's the that's problem. Chris, Chris Waring was looking at setting up, um, setting up a uh, browser stack open source account, uh, which would get us free access to real browser testing. So that might be something that, and they have CI and stuff set up, but I don't know how much support they have for running with web extensions. Yeah, I think some, uh, I think stuff improved. Uh, I need to just revisit it. Um, Cause uh, in the, between the time we had to switch to web extension and now uh, things like headless Chrome and headless Firefox uh, happened. Uh, and. Uh. I'm not sure if those in like how useful are those when you test web extension, but I would. Uh, ask. It, no, it's it's super useful. So like uh, I wrote a compatibility layer for the Puppeteer API to work with Firefox, so I could run tests against both Chrome and Firefox with the same script. Mm -hmm. And that now that's that they're implementing Puppeteer support natively in Firefox, and that allows you to do those types of operations. Mm -hmm. 
sorry to interrupt. I need to drop for the local offline collaboration call, which you're both welcome on if you want to join. And we should think about whether you want to talk about the co-hosting on one of the coming months calls, because it, based on what Dietrich said earlier, it sounds like it could be an interesting fit for that. Oh uh, yeah, so. that's that definitely. I mean, it's probably too early yet, but when when yeah yeah when, when they, you're when they solidify yeah let me know because sure. yeah okay I will talk to you later bye See you bye yeah uh, testing <laughs> yeah there's a there's a there's a lot of surface area mm -hmm. yeah but uh, I I believe like. Uh, the problem with uh, testing uh, JS IPFS or Go IPFS is that those tests already take a lot of time. So uh, that's why I, I like suggested uh, to piggyback on this like benchmarking thing, which would right. run, which would run like once a day, and then send a report if it's like if the build uh, of benchmarks or build of tests against uh, our GUI apps uh, crashes. Yeah, that, that sounds like a really good, really good idea. Mm -hmm. Because yep. yeah, I think you're right. Like especially the volume of commits and stuff. It's definitely not something we need to run per commit yet. But the, I, that knowing once a day will really narrow down many issues and let us know in advance. Yeah, I mean like those tests uh, that safeguard against like the desktop or companion would be pr probably could not like they would not take much time unless we want to ensure like the entire API. Uh, no, that, that we, we probably could make it uh, run short, but it's not something we want to add to regular build. It would be something separate. Um, yeah. I'll, yeah, it's something I need to, at least for the companion, I need to see if we are able to do like actual tests in, uh, in, in Firefox or Chrome. Um, for for JS IPFS, uh, I've been like writing some patches to JS IPFS and running them like running entire test suite locally takes a long time. So there's a mm. switch to just grab uh, specific tests uh, using a, like in some string like I want only tests which have uh, like DNS in the name or stuff like that, uh, just to like not wait half an hour or like 15 minutes for tests to pass. Um, so it's not like we would have something similar for uh, desktop or companion, but we would uh, for sure test specific uh, code paths. Yeah, maybe what I'll start doing is I'll add an agenda item for each one of these items in the list for that many weeks of these meetings. Mm -hmm. So. Next week, I'll have people write out what the smoke test would be for each one of these things and a link to issues. And then <laughs> maybe we'll break this up into uh, row by row, basically, slowly attack it over time. Yeah, that's a good idea. Or even like just start, uh, add just one. Uh, um, yeah, I guess that's yeah that, what we. Call, yeah, call maybe I'll file I'll file an issue each week on one of these. Yeah, and then have yeah. have the group discuss it. Yeah, yeah. How how do we like test stuff right now? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay, I'll uh, see you later. I'm going to join the local offline meeting. Yeah, I'm not able to join this week. Uh, however, the, like the next the next month, because I think local call is uh, monthly, right? Uh, yeah. Next month we'll probably do. Uh, we'll talk about the co-hosting. Uh, cool. Yeah, I think that that would be very interesting for that group. Yeah. All right. See you. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye.